here. Thank you. And we have a special guest with us today. Brother Mark Morgan is our Western District Superintendent. Thank you for joining us. It is such an honor and a privilege to have you here. I've known Brother Morgan for many years. He has ministered in my life many, many a time. And we want to turn this pulpit over to you. We want you to come. We want you to deliver what God has given to you for this church, for this day, for this hour. Minister and speak to us, O oh God, through this man of God. We love you. We appreciate you. Come and take your liberty. Well, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Anybody believe that? Amen. And that's all right. I like that little stand there. Amen. Well, everybody okay? I know the holidays are coming, but they're not here yet. So we want to we magnify the Lord. Thank Him for all of His goodness and His mercy. Amen. preaching the other day and I forgot to turn off and it rang and we used to sing a song years and years ago some of you don't have any idea it's called the royal telephone <laughs> so I didn't know if the Lord was trying to get a hold of me or what was going on amen. amen well it's good to be in East Valley today God bless you amen give honor to Pastor Nielsen and his family and the bishop amen and uh, we did enjoy the singing, the worship. And uh, now, here, here's kind of the dilemma that I'm in this morning is I was really going to just preach something entirely different. But on the way down, the Lord really got to talking to me. And so my problem is, is when I get in a particular subject, it's hard for me to come out. And so I just kind of stay there, camp there, preach there, talk about it. So let's, let's go to John chapter 1, verse number 14. And then we'll also be readings from Romans chapter 1. And uh, I apologize, Sister Morgan's not here, but she is pastoring in San Francisco. And uh, <clears throat> she is the... She's one they love. They put up with me, they love her. And uh, she's uniquely used of God there, amen. John chapter one, verse number 14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Everybody say his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Romans chapter 1 and verse number 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. So they are without excuse because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was dark. And professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. 23, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Everybody said amen. Uh, I, I want to talk to you today about this, uh, I'm going to use the term that Peter used, excellent glory. Excellent glory. Amen. Jesus, I love you. I thank you for this church, the impact they have in this area. Thank you for your anointing. Thank you for your blessings. I'm thankful for this day. I'm thankful for the breath in my body. I'm thankful for life, peace, all things that are given to us by the Spirit. 
I pray today that you would confirm your word with signs following. I take in authority of this service in the name of Jesus. And everybody said amen. amen. God bless you. Turn around and shake somebody's hand and say, it's excellent glory. I have been uh, in a little study about the word glory and trying to really get a handle on the word glory. Uh, I know some of our definitions, doxa, and I see that commentaries, and that's what you got to remember, they're commentaries, somebody making comments. And the attempt to understand or to comprehend the term glory. The best thing to interpret scripture is scripture. And I do believe that there's something very systematic in the scripture. And so it really doesn't matter what we say about glory. It's what does the scripture say about it. How does the scripture show us and reveal to us what would really be the true understanding of glory. Uh, in my study, I come across several statements. One of them basically would be intrinsic wealth, coming from the Old Testament, intrinsic wealth. You'll remember in the Old Testament, God talked about Israel, and sometimes this is a little confusing to people, uh, it talks about Israel and how God adorned her. And, and then it talks about Old Testament men, how they adorned their wives with gold and silver and so on and so forth. Sometimes we misunderstand that. We don't really comprehend what was going on. It wasn't just about ornamentation. It was about the fact that the way that a man would show his wealth, his intrinsic wealth, would be he would adorn his, his wife with it. In other words, if he wanted to show you his glory, then he would show it through his wife by ornamentation. They didn't have currency, they didn't have bank accounts, they didn't have portfolios, but what they did have was gold and silver, and so that's the reason why that the scripture talks and basically what God was saying is, about Israel is I have adorned her. I have adorned her with my wealth. I have adorned her with my glory. And so we understand that the word glory also includes intrinsic wealth. Some other definitions that are given to us is weighty. It talks about the glory being weighty, weightier. Uh, Paul uses that statement and term when he talks about uh, this light affliction, this light affliction worketh in us a far more weightier glory. I am convinced that the things that we suffer in life have the ability to give us degrees of glory. Anybody understand what I'm saying by that? In other words, this life that we live, the things that you go through and the things that you suffer, they have, uh, they have a goal in mind. And that goal is for you to have more glory, for the glory that's a part of your life to be weightier. Now, Paul uses a term that we've heard many, many times, and that, that term is used, uh, I press toward the mark and the prize of the high call. The truest definition of high call, with Paul's writings, was glorification. I'm pressing toward glorification. I keep my eyes on the prize. I keep it on what this is really, really all about. It's about the glory of God. It's about being glorified. Now, some of you may not really understand, most of you will, the term glorified. Uh, Jesus even said it. You know, you tell that fox on the first and second day I'll do miracles, but on the third day I'll be glorified. 
talks about glorification. The scripture talks about glorification. I was preaching one time in a church and after the service I used the word glorified. I was talking about sonship and after service a chemical engineer came up and said, uh, Brother Morgan, did you know that anything that ends with an I-D-E or an I-E-D means you have taken more than one component, fused them together, and they are e eternally inseparable. It doesn't matter how high the fire is, doesn't matter how much you try to heat it, how much you try to separate it, it is now eternally impossible for you to separate them. So when we talk about Jesus Christ being glorified, we're talking about the container of his flesh and the deity that was within him are now fused together and can never be separated. Mm, my, my, my. Amen. Now, I believe that's one of the reasons why he told Mary, don't touch me. I've, I've not yet ascended. Don't touch me. There's some things that's got to happen here. And uh, I believe when he come out of the grave, he came out in glorification. Now, he tells her not to touch him. It's because not only is he glorified, but he's now the eternal high priest. He's going to make intercession. Once the high priest came out from offering the blood sacrifice, nobody could touch him lest he be unclean. He had to go to the mercy seat, put blood on it, and wait for the descending glory. I'm glad that Jesus Christ, our high priest, took the blood of God, put it on the eternal mercy seat, and on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Ghost fell, it was signification that the sacrifice had been accepted, and the glory of God was now going to fill the house of God, or the tabernacle or temple of God. Now, we could go a lot of time in some of those things, but a few weeks ago, I kind of was looking at this and studying and praying about it, and I got a little insight to it I'd like to share with you today. John, of course, John's writings a lot, of course, dealing with the, or the Gnosticism, not agnostics, but Gnosticism, dealing with them, the fact that they said that Jesus wasn't flesh and that there is absolutely no flesh. Uh, everything is logos. Do we understand that? Everything was logos or thought or expression of thought, meaning... Um, best way for me to describe it is you're not really sitting in here today some God somewhere is just thinking all this and so John understood the 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 damnable approach of that doctrine because number one it denied the atonement it denied the fact that God came in flesh to pay the price and also it removed accountability for our actions after all you're not responsible for your actions because you're, you really don't have control. You're not even really real. A God somewhere thought about that. And so if that's the case, then we've got some pretty perverted gods. The devil didn't make you commit fornication and God didn't make you. You did it on your own. Boy, it got quiet, didn't it? Quit blaming the devil and quit blaming God. It's just your old stinking flesh out of control. We sin when we are drawn away by our own lust. And so to deny that Jesus came in the flesh was to deny the atonement, the shed blood of God, and also to remove the accountability of our actions or our sins and put it on God, a God somewhere. So John writes about this. That's the reason why in his gospel writings he starts with this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He goes to the term Logos. He wants them to understand. Uh, <clears throat> I used to preach a message many years ago, and I called it when the thought become a thing. Because the Greeks simply said what I've already told you. We just got a God somewhere, and he just has thoughts. That's what the Greeks taught. That's what the Gnostics taught. The Jews understood it, especially the apostles. They understood, yes, you have to have a thinker, and yes, he has to have a thought. But that thought has to become a thing. And so John says, and the word was made flesh. Yes, God was the thinker of the thought. Yes, God had the thought. But God, who is the thought and the thinker, I'm losing a bunch of you right here. God, who is the thinker and the thought, become a thing. He become flesh. 
he become tangible. Anybody with me here right now? He become tangible. Let me put it where you can understand it. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. For it pleased God that in him it should dwell. So when God got ready to reveal his glory. When God got ready to reveal the invisible. He did it through the man Christ Jesus. So John says, and the word was made flesh, and the word was made flesh. Logos was made flesh, and we beheld the glory. He's the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. I've come today to let somebody know there is no such thing as an eternal son. The very term that he was the only begotten of the Father proves to us that he had a moment of beginning which is conception and there'll be a time that his sonship will cease when he has delivered the kingdom back to God his sonship will cease as we know it his flesh cease when he come out of the grave on the third day victorious over death hell and the grave man I need a little help right here praise God I'm glad that we understand who he is he is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You know, I, I get tickled with some people because they say, well, you know, no, there's three and, 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 you know, you got the Father, you got the Son, and you got the Holy Ghost. So you're telling me that the Father is the Father of Jesus. Yeah, that's exactly right. Well, you know, I was born and raised in Missouri, and I know everybody thinks people back there don't have any sense or education. <laughs> but they did teach us something that's pretty profound you ready for it whoever child is conceived by that's his daddy and the Bible says that the Holy Ghost overshadowed Mary and she conceived so according to the scripture that makes the Holy Ghost the father of Jesus Christ now now we got a problem because we got people saying the father's the father and Luke says that the Holy Ghost is the Father. But wait a minute. Uh, Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 says in regard to the Son. <laughs> he's the everlasting Father. So we got the Father, the Father, the Son, the Father, and the Holy Ghost, the Father. I wish somebody would just tell me who the real Father is here today. Matter of fact, Ray Stevens, some of you don't have any idea who I'm talking about, wrote a song years ago and said, I'm my own grandpa. We understand who the Father of Jesus Christ is. When it talks about the Father, Paul told the Corinthians, but to us there's only one God who is the Father of all, meaning it's God, it's the Spirit, it's Logos. It's Logos. We're headed somewhere here right now. It's Logos. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So you cannot separate God as the Word. When you talk about God, yes, He's a Spirit, but He's also Word. That's why I tell people God doesn't have the last word. God is the last word. Doesn't matter about any other voices. Doesn't matter about what anybody else says. Doesn't matter about the Antichrist. Doesn't matter about denial. Doesn't matter about the agnostics or the atheists. The fact is when it's all said and done, he will still be the word of God. Matter of fact, John seen him coming back to fight the Antichrist. And he had a name written which is called the word of God. And when Jesus said, I go back to share the glory that I had with the Father from the beginning, he's not talking about the eternal Son. What he's saying is, is I was the Word when it all started, and I'm going back to be in the Word. Praise God. Praise God. I feel a little revelation here today. Now that's, and we beheld the glory. How, how did you... John, tell us how you, I understand he could be talking about the Mount of Transfiguration. And this is where Peter said, God spoke to us from his excellent glory. A voice came from his excellent glory. I understand it could be all that. But here's what John said. And the word was made flesh. And we beheld the glory. Now, I understand that you got a Bible and it's paper and ink and leather. But when we talk about the Word, we're not talking about a Bible. 
We're talking about God. Now stay with me. And the word God became flesh. And we beheld the glory. The word of God is truly his nature. It's who he is. And that doesn't change. Does that make sense to anybody? When Peter says he's imparted unto us his divine nature, we've become partakers of his divine nature, then you have to find from the scripture everything that God is. And there's only four or five things the scripture says that God is. God is truth. God is a spirit. Uh, I don't remember what some of the others were. But those are the four. God is holy. Those are four or five things that says God is. So when you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you become a partaker of that divine nature. You were begotten by the Word of God. So the seed of the Word was planted in you by faith there. You received it by faith and a journey began. Now I want you to understand, he said the Word was made flesh. So here is where you really, if you want to understand the glory of God, this is the best example I can give you. Wherever you find the word being fleshed out or the word being manifest by something visible, you are now seeing the glory of God. I don't, I don't know about that. Well... Let's just kind of talk. You want to talk about it in a second? Let's see what Paul has to say about it. You ready? For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. In other words, these invisible things are clearly seen. Now, from the creation of the world, they are clearly seen. Being understood by the things that are made. Now, if you want to understand the invisible, look for something that's made visible to show you what the invisible really is. Right? Even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. Now, I want you to understand. I, I just jotted this down a while ago. Maybe it doesn't make sense to you, but it does to me. Being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. Now, I want to ask you a question. If there are three in the Godhead, why didn't Paul say, even there? eternal power and Godhead but he doesn't say there it's singular mm. his eternal power and Godhead who is the he or the his in that who was made manifest mm. Who is made manifest? See, we're without excuse. Somebody said, is there really a God? You're without excuse. You know why you're without excuse? There's a sun in the sky. There's a moon at night. There's stars. There's the sea. There's the ocean. There's land. Where did all that come from? The Word. So all of creation reveals the glory of God. So when man says there's not a God, the Bible says you're... you're, you're I'm not calling you one, but the Bible says you're a fool. Because all of creation reveals this invisible word. In the beginning, 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 in the beginning. How does it start? And God said, that's how it starts. Let there be light, and there was light. Let there be stars, and there were stars. Let there be a moon, and there was a moon. Let there be a sun, and there was a sun. Let there be dry land, and it come up out of the waters. Let there be sea. Let there be a dividing of the firmament. Let there be animals. Let there be. Let there be. Let there be. And that invisible God of yours said, you really want to know who I am and what I am? Look at creation. Woo! I feel like preaching here just a second. Look at creation. Now, Paul didn't just stop there. He says, even his eternal power and Godhead. Now, what's the terminology? Because it's really important here. Even his eternal, so they are without excuse. The Godhead and his eternal power is without excuse. Why? Because, well, it's, it's invisible. Well, it was invisible, but he said, even his eternal power, so they are without excuse because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, Neither were thankful, became vain in their imaginations. Their foolish heart was darkened. Now, I want you to show you something. Paul 
picks us up. You have to understand that in order to understand the invisible, you look for the visible. Now, I know I keep hitting that point, but it's very important. You look for the visible. You look for something that was created or begotten by the Word of God. Now, here's, here's what Paul says to the Corinthians. What, is, is this boring? Okay. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, he talks about Moses coming down the mountain, and Moses has the glory of God shining on his face, shining on his face. And he has to put this veil over it because the glory was going to fade. And with the fading glory, man would associate the fading glory with the law. In other words, once they seen the glory at its peak with Moses' face, and then they seen it diminish down, they would think that once it was completely gone, then the law would be without effect. The glory and the law would go together. Once one faded, the other would fade. Does that make sense? That's what Paul was teaching. But where he's going to is this. He's going to the face of Jesus Christ. He's going to show you that, yes, the law in Moses had a fading glory. But Jesus Christ, his glory is not a fading glory because it's an eternal glory. My, my, my. Now, he tells you this a little later. He tells you this a little later. In the third and the fourth chapter, all one big paragraph and running together and exegesis there. Now, the deal is, when he gets over to the fourth chapter, he says, you will see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. In other words, he says in the third chapter, with open face, we behold his glory. In other words, there is no veil to hide the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. It's not a fading glory. It's not a glory that will pass. It is an eternal glory. Eternal glory. I find that amazing because Paul uses Moses with the deal about the veil. There's another thing about Moses. If you'll remember, Moses is on top of the mountain and he asks God, show me thy glory. And God said, I can show you my hinder parts, but I can't show you my face. Why can't he show him his face? Well, first of all, what's the hinder parts? I've heard people preach, God turned his backside to Moses. Nope. Hinder parts is the past creation. Show me thy glory. What he's saying is, I can show you what's already created. I can show you from Genesis chapter 1 to present tense. I can show you that because it reveals my glory. But I can't show you my face because he doesn't exist yet. He's not here yet. He will be begotten. I can't show you something that's not made visible. I can't show it to you. But trust me, one of these days you'll get to see it. Isn't it amazing that on the Mount of Transfiguration, it was Moses and Elijah that God called to the top of it. Moses, what I couldn't show you back on the Mount of the Law, I can show you here on the Mount of Transfiguration because the glory of God is in the face of Jesus Christ. Praise God! Praise God! Woo. Now, now, let me, let me just ask you a theological question. Are you ready for it? If the Godhead is made known by what is created or made visible, then I'm going to ask you a sincere question today. Where, if there are three persons, personages in the Godhead, somebody please tell me where the Father was ever made known in the visible. And the same thing with the Holy Ghost. I asked this to somebody the other day. They said, the dove. I said, it didn't say he was a dove. It said he descended like unto a dove. And Paul said, trust me, he's not made visible as some kind of an animal or by something that's corruptible. In other words, no statue is going to reveal him to you. No beast is going to reveal him to you. So I'm going to ask you the question again. If... The invisible things, even the Godhead, are made known by what is made visible. I want somebody to tell me where the revelation or the Father being made visible happened. And you've got to tell me where the Holy Ghost made visible happened. That might be the reason why that Paul said we're buried with him, 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 him. We're back to his that Paul says in Romans 1. And then we go a little further. He said we are buried with him in 
baptism, not with them in baptism. Because in order for me to be buried with you in baptism, it means you had to exist, you had to die, they had to put you in a grave. If I baptize you in the name of the Father, that means I've got to prove to you historically where the Father lived, where he died, and where he was buried. And i got to do the same thing with the Holy Ghost. Where did he live? Where did he die? Where was he buried? I can't bury you with the Father. He never died as far as you know it, if you believe in the Trinity. He never died. He was never buried. And the same thing with the Holy Ghost. But I'm glad today to report to you that yes, the Father was made known and the Father was made visible. That's the reason why Jesus Christ said, when you've seen me, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. We're not there with them. There's not them or there in the Godhead. I was, I was tickled because I kept making the statement. I called some friends of mine away church today and I said, where, where was he revealed if this is? And I said, you know, there's an old book out. It's called, Is the Godhead in Jesus or is Jesus in the Godhead? When I walked into... Pastor Nelson's office, he had that book laid on the desk. I guess God was saying, yeah, yeah, see, there it is. You're right on track here this morning. I'm going to ask you that question. Is Jesus in the Godhead or is the Godhead in Jesus? Is Jesus one-third of the Godhead or is the Godhead in Jesus? I never find anywhere the scripture says that Jesus was in the Godhead, but I do find one that says, in him, in him, in him. Jesus was not in the Godhead. The Godhead was in Jesus. Why did I say that? Because his eternal power and his Godhead are made known by something that's revealed. So when, so when you see Jesus Christ, you are seeing the Word made flesh. You are seeing God made known. Woo. Now, I set you up and you didn't know it. I set you up. Come up here. I won't pick on you a little bit. So, wh when did you receive the Holy Ghost? August 31st, 1980. Okay, come up here. August the 31st, 1980. So, here's Brother Wiley on August the 30th? 31st, 1980. God looked at him and said, Okay, I'm going to beget you. And hear this, how this is going to happen. It's going to happen by my word. So how does that happen? You ever heard of gospel preaching? The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. So that invisible God, which is also the word, said, okay, I'm going to plant something in you. Now, here's another statement that Paul uses. Christ in you, the hope, the future of glory. Now, here's what people don't understand. All things return to its source. So when God made that deposit in you, the Holy Ghost, his divine nature, this hope of glory, he deposited a seed of glory in you. And that thing said, I'm going to lead you home. <laughs> yeah. And when he, the spirit of truth, has come, thy word is truth. So when he, the spirit, is this too much like a Bible study? I mean, I'll scream again if you want me to and you think I'm preaching. And they've already paid me, so whether I stop now or later, I'm okay. Now, here, here's what happened. God said, okay, I'm going to put a deposit in you. And it started by you being begotten by the Word. So the Word is invisible. But when you, by faith, obeyed it, it started being visible. When you went to the water and was baptized, 
You were taking something that was spoken, the invisible word. Well, we heard it. I understand. But you took that and you said, now it's going to be made visible. That's why baptism is essential. Baptism is important. And so now it begins. You have been born again of the water and of the spirit. You were begotten by the word of God. The word of God was like the seed planted in you. And by faith, it become life. It become life. Now, here's where the fun began. That in you says, you're like Paul. You see the prize of the high call? My excellent glory. Excellent glory. Yes, excellent glory. What's the excellent glory? Well, we got time. The excellent glory is the Mount of Transfiguration. When Jesus takes Moses and Elijah, Peter, James, and John, so he's got the law, he's got the prophets, and he's got apostles. And they are on this mountaintop with him, and the Bible says he didn't start, he, he starts glowing like a light bulb. Light wasn't shining on him, light was shining out of him. And what God is showing them is what he will look like in the state of glorification. Now, John's seen it on the Mount of Transfiguration first, but he also seen it on the Isle of Patmos when he looked over to the end of everything. And this is what he said, in the city where the Lamb is the light. I've already seen that. I've seen that back on the Mount of Transfiguration. I seen, and Peter said, his excellent glory. I seen where there was no flesh to veil him. It was not a fading glory. It was excellent glory. And we beheld it. We seen it. We seen what he looked like in the state of glorification. Y'all with me here? So, that excellent glory, here we go. That excellent glory will also, man, I, I, I got to stop because I'm, I'm starting to get into something here. And it could be dangerous. <laughs> See, if I understand John's writings, he says, if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, which he hath testified of his son. Okay? Now that's important to understand. There's only two witnesses of the Spirit in the Scripture. Would you like to know what they are? The first one is when Jesus is in the waters of baptism. This pure, spotless, sinless man goes into the water to be baptized and John his cousin says oh we got this backwards you're the lamb of God you should be baptizing me and Jesus said nope you baptize me that all righteousness be fulfilled because what you don't understand is I'm not going to be the only son of God and they got to see how they're supposed to do it I got to make something visible for them and so Jesus is in the waters of baptism, comes up, the Holy Ghost comes descending like unto a dove. Somebody said, well, I don't get that. Why does it say, man, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm, this is not good. I mean, I could really mess this whole thing up here today. Well, if we understand Peter says, Noah was saved by water. Remember, and so are we saved by water. He's talking about baptism. Now, if you understand mm, what happened is, is over here. Uh, Noah goes in the ark over here in the old world. Does this make sense? Noah, the ark, everybody know who I'm talking about? Okay, Noah gets in the ark over here in the old world, and the water carries him from an old world over to a new world. Boom. And the way he knew he was in a new world is when that dove come back with an olive branch. And so all that's happening in the waters of baptism is God saying, I gave you a type all the way back over there. You're going to come through the water. When you come through the water, there'll be a witness of the Spirit. There'll be a dove that will descend. And so Jesus is just showing you what happens. So when you went into the waters of baptism and you come out on the other side, when you stepped into that baptistry, you were telling God, I'm leaving my old world and I'm headed to be a new creature and a new creation in Christ Jesus. I'm headed to a new world. And God said, and just like the man Christ Jesus, I'm going to bear witness. Woo. You know what bearing witness means? It is the voice of the Father that spake. It is the voice of God that spake. You can argue all you want to. You can deny it. You can fuss about it. You can cuss about it. You say, I don't believe it. But here's the fact. When the voice of the Father speaks, it is a spiritual utterance. 
And Jesus said to Nicodemus in John 3, he said, the wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof. The Greek word for sound is phone. It means phonics, language or speech. Jesus just told Nicodemus, when you're born of the Spirit, there'll be a language. There'll be some phonics. There'll be some speech. That's how come on the day of Pentecost, when they come over into a whole new creation, the Bible said they heard them speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Tongues is not the Holy Ghost. Tongues is the witness of the Spirit saying, that's my child now. That's where I live now. That's where my glory abides. That's my tabernacle. Praise God. Praise God. Well, I, I, I never talked in tongues. Uh, I don't think you have to. Well, let me finish that verse. And so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Woo. I'll let you figure that out. So here he is. He's just, he's kind of like Jesus over here. I understand when Jesus is born fully, God fully, man. I understand he had it without measure. You get it. I, I, I get all, I understand all that. I'm talking about what the scripture teaching us here now. The deal is, so here he is over here in the waters, and that's where you started. So that night, when you was either baptized or filled with the Holy Ghost, it was God saying, hey, you're my tabernacle. You're my, you're the place where my glory dwells. And I want to call to you from the excellent glory. So here's the deal. The journey of Christianity is from the Jordan to the Mount of Transfiguration. And that journey is up a mountain. Now watch this. Watch this. I'm, I'm, I'm starting to wrap it up. And so what happens is Paul says that with open face we behold his glory as in a glass. And we are changed. And we are changed. And we are changed. Where did this Christianity come that says you can be a Christian and there's no change? Still smoke, still cuss, still fornicate, still drink, still party, still whatever. And so God says, okay, with open face, you're changed into my image from glory to glory by his spirit. You can't see his spirit. But it's where the real change happens. And when the spirit makes the change, guess where it's made manifest? Something visible. So what me revealing the glory of God, every time the word of God speaks something to me and I flesh it out and I start making the invisible known, people are starting to see the glory. And so you started on this glory and God says, it's kind of like a stairway, it's kind of like going up a mountain. I'm going to take you from being a partaker of my divine nature, I'm going to take you from the very bottom rung stair which is called faith and then I want you to add to your faith virtue and I want you to add to virtue knowledge and I want you to add to knowledge temperance and I want you to add to temperance patience and I want you to add to patience godliness did I lose you? godliness is number five out of seven and we apostolics move it down to number two Let me give you another word for godliness. You ready for it? Holiness. How in the world can they be holy when they haven't developed any patience? Or they don't have any knowledge? We got people dressed up, cleaned up, and don't even know why. I'll tell you why. You ready for it? Because God is holy. That's his divine nature. And he says, I'm visible, but I want you to make it visible. So don't tell me, don't tell me that how you live and how you look doesn't have anything to do with it. I got news for you, it does. I'm, I'm about to mess this service up really bad. And so the process of Christianity is God shows you something in his word and you struggle with it. There's a transition. 
you, you struggle with a little bit and, and you read it and then you come to Bible study and guess what? The pastor gets up and he teaches on it. You're like, oh, man. <laughs> What's going on? The flesh, the veil, wants to hide it. Wants to keep it invisible. Just wants it to be in your heart. Whatever you do, don't get rid of that veil, your flesh, and make it known. And so you just keep climbing because I press toward the prize. I'm headed to the same excellent glory because when I see the open face of Jesus Christ that's not veiled, I should start changing to look just like that. You ever heard this verse? And all things work together for the good. To those who are called, if I kept you too long, according to his purpose. I understand people write books all the time about purpose driven and I, I believe in it. I like them. I think it's excellent. I'm not knocking it. But sometimes we get so focused on our purpose that we fail to understand his purpose and the next verse tells you his purpose that we might be conformed into the image of his dear son I close with this statement if you get to where you're supposed to go in this life as a Christian before you get out of here you should be able to say the same thing that Jesus said when you've seen me When you've seen me, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Because that glory in me has led me on quite a journey. And the longer you live for God, the more glory people ought to see. Let me ask you a question. When you walk into a place of business, when you walk into your job, what glory do they see? Do they see the glory of God or do they see the glory of of dirt kingdoms. Why do you think the second temptation, he takes him up to a high mountain and he shows him all the kingdoms and their glory, their wealth, and says, I'll give all that to you if you'll just bow and worship me. I'll give you the glory of kingdoms of dirt. I'll give you the glory of temporal things. This old body's temporal. I'll give you the glory of temporal things if you'll just give me an exchange for that. Make me, Lord. Make me, Lord. No. No, I don't think. And the same thing happens to you. Every one of you is going to go through those three temptations. And the enemy is going to try to get you to change the glory. Swap me the glory. Give me that eternal glory that should have been yours, Adam. And I'll give you the glory of dirt. Earthly kingdoms wealth no, I don't want to make the exchange don't want to swap it and that's exactly where we're at right now in the end time are you listening to me the enemy's doing everything he can to get us to exchange the glory why would we exchange a temporal glory an incomplete glory for an excellent glory Woo. I hear the Holy Ghost calling all of us today come on up the mountain the view is well worth it when you get to the top. I press toward the prize. Anybody here today, it's in you right now. It's in you right now. I hear the Holy Ghost calling me. I hear that glory compelling me. I, I, I want to get more like him. I want his nature to be made manifest through me a little better. Come on. If you're here today without the Holy Ghost and you've never been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, then I challenge you to become a son of God. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know when he appears, we shall be like him. That's what it's really all about, to be like him. Anybody here, if you want the Holy Ghost, come. You want the word of God, come. The word of God will beget you. If you hear that excellent glory calling to you right now, if you hear something on the top of the mountain like Moses calling to the top of the mountain, somebody ought to answer to that call and start climbing up the mountain right now. I'm headed up the mountain. I'm headed up to the excellent glory. I hear the Holy Ghost calling me right now. 
Just go on and praise him, my friend. That's it. Go on and praise him. God wants to give you the Holy Ghost today. There it goes right there. There it goes right there. Yes. Yes. God's been coming. There it is. So they're going to keep praying for you, all right? Just keep going. God's going to take over here in a second, all right? You're going to speak in another way. In the name of Jesus. Woo! That's what I hear the glory call. Christ in me, the hope of glory is calling to a greater glory. Time began. 